instruction. Okay, that's called um, that's called measurement error bias. And in a simple regression like this, it will always make things seem uh, make the relationship. Uh, well, actually, it, sorry. So it depends. In this case, if the thing over there enters the denominator, it creates an artificial negative relationship. If the thing, uh, if we were comparing earnings to wages, then it would create an artificial positive relationship. So what do you do when there's endogeneity? The same thing is driving both sides of the equation. If you've taken 140, uh, I think. I think you would have learned this in 140. If you have some kind of endogeneity problem, then you need an instrument, an instrumental variable. You need something that is like a proxy for your wage that goes up when your wage goes up, but that doesn't have the same measurement error problem. And so what they use is instead of looking at the relationship between how many hours you work and your effective wage, they look at the relationship between the number of hours you worked and the average effective wage of all the other drivers in your fleet that day. Right? So on a high wage day, their wages are going up too, but their measurement error isn't affecting your, your data. Okay? So that's just a methodological note. What do they find? Not surprisingly, they find that hours are negatively related to wages, right? So that the wage elasticity of labor supply at the daily level is in fact negative. But the, the daily labor supply curve is downward sloping. Okay, um, here's where you see this in their data. All right, these are three different data sets, um, three different firms. I don't want to get into the details. We'll just focus on this one. They took the log, the natural log of the number of hours the person worked each day, and regressed it on the natural log of their hourly wage, and they get this number right here. Okay, negative point three one nine. Um, and so what they're estimating, sorry. What they've actually got here, this number, this negative 0.319, that is, the, that is the elasticity of supply. Elasticity. It is equal to the percent change in hours for a given percent change in the wage. That's the elasticity. So this is, an, again, something that you either will have or will learn in 140, but I'll just uh, write it out for you as a note. This is, this is not something that will be on the exam. I just want you to see it and know it. So as you, as you should have learned in 100A, this elasticity, the percent change in hours that you get in response to a given percent change in the wage, that is equal to, or it's the equivalent of, just taking that, the, the derivative, right, how much the absolute the number of hours changes when there's an absolute change in the wage, and multiplying it by W over H. Right? So this you should have learned in 100A, and you can review it. It's not super important. You can convince yourself this is true very easily. It turns out, now this is what's really cool, is it turns out that that is, that is actually the same thing as regressing the log of hours on the log of wages, taking the derivative of the log of hours with respect to the log of wages. Okay? So if you have a regression, if you have a regression equation where you can say h is equal to the number of hours you work is some gamma, some coefficient, times the wage plus some random error term, that thing right there, right? if you just take the first derivative of this equation with respect to w, that's telling you dh dw, that's how much your hours, that gamma right there, is how, how much your hours go up or down when your wage changes. If instead, uh, alternatively, if you run a regression which is first you take the log of hours and you regress that on the log of wages, right? so you're saying that when the log of the wage goes up by one point, beta is how much the log of the hours goes up or down, okay? then that beta is the derivative of the log of hours with respect to the log of wages. And that's the elasticity. So that's the magic of taking logs in regression is that the coefficient you get back out is literally the elasticity. It's the percent change in hours that you get for a given percentage change in the wage. Okay? Okay. This, is just all, this is just FYI. You will not be tested on this whatsoever. But I want you to be able to understand the results when you look at a regression table because a huge, huge percentage of the results that you'll see reported in um, economic papers are um, coefficients from a regression of the log of one thing on the log of, the other, of another thing. And that coefficient is an elasticity. Okay? And so what they found is that that, that, that labor supply elasticity is negative. Okay? All right. Drivers have a negative elasticity, aka downward sloping daily supply curve. Now, there's always, there's always going to be some problem when you're, trying to prove, when you're trying to prove something on the basis of observational evidence instead of experimental evidence. There's always going to be some confound. Here's the confound in this case. Okay, we want to know, could this just be a selection effect? There's selection effects, right? So we've talked about how income effects can confound with observational results, and we've, we've talked about um, various other confounds in, um, in both the list study, right? We had um, reverse causation. Here's another classic kind of confound, which is a selection effect. It could be that the same workers show up to drive their taxis every day, and when the wage is high, they all work a little bit less. Or it could be that on low wage days, only the really eager beaver drivers show up at all, and when the wage is high, it pulls all the lazy drivers out of the woodwork. Right? They say, oh, high wage day, I'll go to work today, I didn't even want to bother yesterday, the wage was too low. So what you have is that the, the wage is actually affecting the selection of which drivers show up to work each day. And then you would expect to see the average supply across all drivers go down on a high wage day, not because anybody is reducing the number of hours they work, but because it's pulling all the lazy drivers out and they don't work that much even on a high wage day. And there's no way that we can figure that out uh, in this data. In fact, there's some suggestion that that might be true. Here, if you look at this line of this table, these results have no fixed effects. That means that they're looking across all drivers. These results here include driver fixed effects. You'll learn what that means in econometrics if you haven't already. It means that those results are only comparing the relationship between hours and wages within a specific driver across different days. And sure enough, the result goes away. So that makes it look like, huh, maybe this result is being driven by a selection effect where lazy drivers are showing up more on high wage days. You don't see it going away in this data sample, right? This is a different firm, different bunch of trip sheets, different bunch of drivers. They're adding the fixed effects so that you're only looking at the relationship for a specific driver across different days. It doesn't make the effect go away. And so we have inconclusive results. And as usual, the way to solve the problem is, let's go to a controlled experiment. All right. And if you want a controlled experiment in a labor market, you should go to Zurich and ask Ernst Fair, because he's the master of labor market experiments, both in the lab and in the field. And not only that, he's a sweetheart. Okay. So Fair and Goethe, back in 2002, studied the labor supply of bicycle messengers in Zurich. Okay? Bicycle messengers are engaged in an activity that is very similar to what cab drivers are doing. Right? There's a completely, there's a steady but unpredictable supply of requests for transportation from one part of the city to another. In this case, for stuff rather than people. Um, I mean, I guess you could, well, yeah, stuff, not people. This setup is a little bit different. This market is run a little bit different than the New York cab driver experiment, uh, the market. In this case, these firms, there are two big bicycle messenger firms. Uh, they're called Flash and Velo City or something like that. Um, and the way they do things is that they, they, uh, they allow messengers to sign up for different shifts each week. They put up a calendar, and the messengers can just sign up for the number of shifts they want. Okay? Now, once you've signed up for a five-hour shift, you've got to show up for that whole shift. But during a shift, 
right? They're going around, they've got the big bag, and they've got a little walkie-talkie strapped onto the strap of the, on the strap of the bag, and they all receive the same calls from the dispatcher. Oh, there's a, you know, somebody wants a document sent from, you know, here to there. And then they get to decide whether or not they want to respond to each call. So they don't determine the number of hours that they work during a shift, but they determine how much effort to put into working, okay? So we're looking at a very similar kind of behavioral response. It's not the total number of hours, but it's still an effort question. It's how much effort cost are you willing to put into generating revenue for yourself, okay? And then, of course, the messengers are paid. They're 100% commission. They don't get, a, they don't get a, uh, an hourly wage. They only get a percentage of the revenue. For the, so so that the more effort they put in, the more money they make. Okay. If we want experimental control so that we eliminate the selection effect, we have to go out and get a ton of money and actually manipulate these people's wages exogenously. This is what Ernst Fair is famous for. He gets massive quantities of money from somewhere. I don't know where. Probably the Swiss government or some secret Swiss bank account. Who knows? Um, but he gets these massive grants and he goes and runs these ridiculously high-budget experiments. So what he did was he actually went and, and gave these workers at these companies a 25% increase in their commission for a one-month period. Okay? And he did it to control for, he did, he controlled for a lot of things. He did it's a really great design. Uh, it's on DSpace. You can read it. It's a, great, it's a really fun paper. Um, so the first month, right, he actually, what he did was he had two companies, and he split one of the companies into two groups, A and B, and the other company served as a control. Because right? you might expect that if you're doing something experimental to half the workers in a company, it might actually impact the other half of the workers in some way. So to control for that, he actually looked at the other company, which is more, sort of more segregated. So the first month, group A messengers got a 25% increase in their commission, and group B didn't, and the second month, it was just the reverse. Okay? So these two months serve as controls for one another. You can control within a month, you can control across months, you can control against another firm where the thing's not happening at all. He's got lots of different dimensions of experimental control. And the change in the wage doesn't have anything to do with unobservable factors like the weather or anything like that. Um, okay. And then he just goes and they, they just go and they measure the number of shifts that each person, that each messenger signs up for. Um, and how hard they worked as measured by their revenue during a shift, right? which is a proxy for work effort. All right, what do they find? In terms of the number of shifts per month, on average across the two months, the control group did 8.7 shifts per month per, per messenger, and the treated group did 12.4 uh, shifts per month. So the, the increase in the daily wage pulled them into the labor market substantially. Okay? Now we can compute, and this I would like you to know, we can compute the elasticity of shifts, the wage elasticity of shifts. Right? So we know that what we're looking for is the percent change we want, the percent change in shifts, for a given percent change in the wage. Okay, so we have that. The, so the change in shifts, delta shifts, is 12.4 minus 8.7, which is 3.7. The percent change in shifts is 3.7 divided by 8.7, yeah? Which is equal to 0.42, which is a 42% increase. You can do this as proportions or percentages, it obviously doesn't matter. The change in wage, we already know the percent change in the wage. Sorry, the percent change in shifts, the percent change in the wage is 25%, right? And so the elasticity is the elasticity, well, this thing is just 42% divided by 25%, which is 1.68. So that number is conceptually exactly the same thing as that uh, regression coefficient that I showed you in the table on the last slide, or two slides ago. It's the percent change in the number of shifts that these people choose to do in response to a percent change, given percent change in their daily wage. And it's positive, right? So their labor market participation decision, their willingness to show up for work is greater. Okay. Now what we really want to know is, what about their effort level, as measured by the revenue that they generate during a shift? Okay. These are measured in Swiss francs, which apparently in Switzerland, Swiss francs is CHF. I don't know why. Um, so the control group, on average across the two months, earned 309 Swiss francs per shift, and the treated group, 295 Swiss francs per shift. Right? So lower revenue for the treated group, which implies lower effort. They responded to fewer calls, or maybe they responded to the easier calls that don't earn as much money. What is the implied wage elasticity? Okay, so the change in uh, earnings, sorry, revenue, just to keep it consistent. Change in revenue is 295 minus 309, which is equal to negative 14. The percent change in revenue is negative 14 over 295, which is 0.048 a 4.8% decrease, sorry, negative 4.8% negative 4, 4. decrease. Again, we know that the change in the percent change in the wage, sorry, what did I do wrong? <coughs> Over 309, thank you. And that's gonna change the math a little bit, sorry. Shoot, okay, so I made that mistake in my notes. So this is gonna be actually a slightly smaller number. It's, it's gonna be slightly smaller than negative 0.048, and you should redo the math yourself to convince yourself that you know what's going on. The change in the wage is exogenously controlled, it's 25%, so the elasticity is gonna be approximately negative 4.8 over 25, and why am I saying approximately? Because um, because I got the 4.8 wrong. Um, sorry, whoops. so tell me what this number is supposed to be. 0.045, negative 0.045. That's excellent, thank you. And then so negative 4.5 divided by 0.5. And this number is negative 0.181. Brilliant, thank you. That's the elasticity, uh, the wage elasticity of daily effort as proxied by daily revenue. Okay? And it's negative. The point here is that it's negative. The point is that even though people are smart enough to figure out, oh, I should go to work on more, I should, I should work more when the wage is high, they apparently do not translate that into actually putting out more effort and earning more money on those shifts. Okay? And again, this, yeah, go ahead. So you're saying because there's more people working on those days when there's a high wage, that there's more competition, so maybe actually the wage that's possible goes down? Uh, yeah, so there's more people trying to respond to those calls, so you might put out just as much effort, or be willing to put out more effort, but just fail. Um, Certainly that could be the case, and I'm sorry, this is going to be one of those situations where I don't actually remember the details of the paper well enough to know how they controlled for that. I'm fairly confident that that's been addressed in the paper, and if you send me an email asking me that question, I will look into it and give you an answer. Okay. Um, but, but good eye for possible uh, remaining confounds in the experiment. All right. Um, yeah. So now let's just begin. I've only got three minutes, but we'll just get started on looking at the, uh, the alternative behavioral model that can explain these results. 
And the first thing that we need to address is the fact that I, there is a glaring and very significant error in your handout, for which I apologize. It's right here. So cross out what you've got in your handout there for the, uh, for the revenue function above the kink and put in what I've got here on the slide. I apologize for that uh, mistake. But basically the idea here, again, going back to the, the concept of reference-dependent preferences, that people have a reference point for how much money they want to make that's determined, that, that, that's, that's determined as a, a kind of a, uh, an income target, a daily income target. It's a little hard to know exactly what that means conceptually, uh, but it's very easy to understand what it means operationally. It means that each day that, that each driver or each bicycle messenger has a certain amount of money that they set out to make, and not necessarily that they stop working when they make that, but that any money above that target just matters less to them. That there's a kink in their utility function when they reach that, that, that reference uh, target income, that reference point. Okay, so completely the same concept that we've been dealing with of a kink in a utility function, but it's going to be operationalized somewhat differently. All right, so we'll plug this back into our profit maximization model, and what we have here is that the revenue function, here's how much you work each day, Here's the revenue function. I won't call it W times L anymore. I'll just call it revenue. And then there'll be a cost function in here as well. And the revenue function is going to have a king. So it's going to start out being W times L. And then when you reach some target income, your daily income target, which I've called K, it's going to, there's going to be a king. Okay? And the actual sort of, this is why revenue is in quotes all along. It's because it's not you're not really maximizing revenue. You're maximizing the utility you get from revenue. And what this says is that once you've reached your income target, okay, you'll just stop caring that much about money for that day. You'll just say, you know what? I reached my target. I still care about money, but... I'm at my kink, okay? and more money just doesn't matter as much to me. Right, so this is capturing exactly the same psychological insight that we captured in reference dependence in the previous model. And where we'll pick up next time, and this is where the problem set starts, problem set two that's posted, is that now that kink, right, we're looking for a place, a point of tangency between this line and this slope, and now there's going to be two. And it's going to become much more difficult uh, to figure out where the profit maximizing point is going to be. And furthermore, this kink is going to play a really big role because nine times out of ten, it's going to turn out that the profit maximizing thing to do is to just work until you reach your target and then go home. So we'll pick up there uh, and uh, get started on the problem set right away. It will help you to get puzzled early. <laughs>